In this video, I want to introduce the notion of a direct product of two groups. This is a way of building a new group from two already known groups. And it turns out that in Judson's textbook, the notion of the direct product is not officially defined until much, much later. Uh, but there is sort of like a naive principle used um, earlier in the text. And so I just actually want to officially define it right now so we can talk about it officially. So imagine we have two groups, G and H. And I've, I've included their operations here to emphasize the fact that the operations between G and H don't have to have anything to do with each other. Circle is an operation for G and asterisk is a operation for H. They might have nothing to do with each other. But given these two groups, we can define a new group on the Cartesian product of H of G and H right here. So remember, G cross H as a set is the Cartesian product. We're going to be taking the set of all ordered pairs, G comma H, where G belongs to G and H belongs to H. So this Cartesian product is a set. Now to make it a group, we have to define a binary operation on that set. On that set. And what we're going to do is we're going to define what we call component wise multiplication. So when you have two ordered pairs, you have G H and G prime H prime, we're going to define component wise multiplication be the following. Well, since G and G prime both belong to G, we can operate on them by using the circle. So that's what we're going to do for the first component, G circle G prime. Likewise, H and H prime both belong to the set H, and therefore we have the operation asterisk that we can use. So we're going to operate on those elements in that way, H asterisk H prime. And so this is what we call component-wise multiplication. I claim that this, this binary operation attached to the Cartesian product gives you a group structure, and this is referred to as the direct product of G and H. So let's now prove that this a binary operation satisfies the three axioms of a group. It needs to be associative, it needs to have an identity, and it needs to be, it needs to have inverses. So to show associativity, we have to take three arbitrary elements of the group. Um, and as the group is the set of ordered pairs here, we're going to just take three arbitrary ordered pairs. We can take a GH, a G prime, H prime, and a G double prime, H double prime. And so then we have to operate them up together. So we're, to do associativity, we're going to do the second two first, the last two first, and then the first one. So according to, according to the component-wise multiplication, I should operate the G prime and G double prime using circle. I'm going to operate together H prime and H double prime using asterisk, like so. This now gives us an order pair, which if we do component-wise multiplication again, we've put the first coordinate together. So we're going to get G times G prime circle G double prime, which does require the appropriate use of parentheses here. Uh, next, we're also going to take, for the second component, we're going to take H to times H prime H double prime. So you see this right here again. Make sure you have the parentheses. Now, we have to be really careful about parentheses because, again, we're trying to show associativity. If we're too careless with our parentheses, we might fall into the danger of circular reasoning. So we don't want to do that. Don't do that. that. That would be bad. Okay, so with that in mind, though, if you look at just the first component, this is an element that belongs to G. And because it belongs to G, G has an associative operation. We can redo the parentheses like we do here. And the same thing for the second component. The second component lives entirely inside of the group H. And in H, the operation is associative, so we can redo the parentheses like we did here. Now it just comes down to unraveling this thing, right? So notice we're operating on the right now by a G double prime, H double prime. So in terms of component-wise multiplication, we can take this G double prime and H double prime out into its own ordered pair. And if you're not convinced at all, take this thing and do component-wise multiplication, you'll get back this thing right here. And then the same thing right here. Since we're operating, operating, we can rip this thing apart by component-wise operations. You get this thing right here. If you're not convinced, push it forward, and you'll see that the two things are equal to each other. And so now what we've seen here is that if you operate on the last two first, that's the same thing as operate on the first two first. And that's the associativity axiom proven right there. So component-wise multiplication is associative because the original two operations are associative. What about identities? Well, we need a candidate for the identity. And that candidate is actually going to be the identity of G with the identity of H. So if you take G's identity as the first component and you take H's identity, which could be totally different things, I'm just going to call both of them E in this context, abusing some notation there. 
But if you take the identities of G and H and put them together in an ordered pair, that's going to be the identity of G cross H. And so what do we get here? Well, E, e, e times G H by component wise multiplication, you're going to get E operating on G and E operating on H. That just gives you the element G H, right? So that's what an identity should do. But what if we do the, if we check on the right as well, well, by component wise multiplication, you get G E and H E, but that's again, gives you back G H. So we have an identity element on G cross H. Just as a quick uh, text expert moment right here, if you want to put that cross symbol, this is just backslash times uh, in LaTeX right there. Uh, so now inverses, we need a candidate for the inverses. Well, if you have an element GH, we're actually just going to take as its first component G inverse and it's the second component H inverse. I claim this is the inverse element. Well, by component wise multiplication, you put together the first components and the second components. Well, looking at just the first component, G inverse and G with respect to the circle operation, they're inverses, so you're going to get back the identity. For the second component, H inverse times H, when you operate those together, you're going to get back the identity. So H inverse H, uh, G inverse H inverse is the left identity, is the left inverse, excuse me. But the same thing happens on the right. Um, if you if you multiply this element on the, on the right, you're going to get a G circle G inverse, which is the identity. And you're going to get an H star H inverse, which is the identity as well. So we see that GH inverse is just G inverse H inverse. And therefore, G cross H has inverses, and that establishes that G cross H is a group. The direct product is a very important way of building groups using smaller groups. Uh, and these do give us something that's potentially new from groups we haven't seen before. So for example, perhaps one of the most famous of all direct product groups is the so-called Klein-4 group. Uh, named after Felix Klein. And so the Klein-4 group is formed by the following way. We're going to take the group Z2 cross Z2, which that is we take this, this group of order two and we take all the possible pairings, right? So Z2 is itself the group one and zero. And so we take all the possible pairings. There's going to be four of them. So you get zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, and one, one. This is what's called the Klein-4 group. It's a group of order four. Now, some things to notice about this group. Um, if we looked at its subgroups, so you see the Hase diagram illustrated right here, the Klein-4 group is often denoted as V sub four. I'm not exactly sure why it's a V. I imagine that's probably a German thing. Don't speak German myself. Maybe I ought to, uh, but but you know it's, it's it's V4 there. It'll That'll be a subgroup. You'll have the trivial subgroup itself, which in this case, the identity would be zero, zero. Then you're gonna have three subgroups of order two. There's going to be the subgroup that contains the identity and the element 10. There's the subgroup that contains the identity and the element 11. And there's the subgroup that contains the identity and 01. These are three distinct subgroups of order 2. Uh, they're, they're distinct from each other. They're subgroups in their own right. And there is no intermediate subgroups. Uh, so you get a Hase diagram that looks like the following. This is supposed to be seen in contrast to the cyclic, or well, to, to the group Z4, right? Uh, sometimes referred to as a cyclic group of order four. Uh, it is a group of order four, and it's abelian. The Klein-4 group is also abelian. I should mention that. But when you look at the subgroup structure um, at the Hase diagram, you see something very different. The identity uh, can make a subgroup, the trivial subgroup. There's the whole group itself, Z4. But as you search for subgroups of order two, there's only one subgroup of order two that contains zero and two. The problem is if you try to take like one, right? If, you, if you're looking for a subgroup that contains one, if you have one, you're gonna to have to contain one plus one, which is two. Um, if you have one and two, you're gonna to have to have one plus two, which is three, because it should be closed. But then you have everything at that point, right? Um, the same thing happens if you do three. If you take a subgroup that contains three, you have to contain three plus three, which is two. You have to have three plus two, which is one, and then you get the whole group again, right? So when you compare these things side by side, right? The Hase group for Z4, it'll contain the subgroup containing zero and two and it'll contain the trivial subgroup. So there's only three subgroups. But with the Klein-4 group, you get these three distinct subgroups of order two. And so this tells us that these two groups are fundamentally different from each other. Uh, and in group theory, we'd say that these groups are non-isomorphic, uh, which is something we'll talk about in the future. But basically, these two groups are not different representations of the same structure. They're two very different groups, even though they both are abelian of order four.